fucking God, it finally came out. And I don't mean that in like a, oh my God, yes, finally. It's more like a, oh wow, they actually released this on April Fools, but sadly, not a joke. I've been saying for years that Morbius feels like a movie that was made back in 2003, and then they intentionally lost it in their basement, and then someone's nephew tracked it down during an internship and was like, oh my God, guys, you know we have an entire movie starring Jared Leto? here and uh, now we're being subjected to it. And I mean that in the worst way because some of my favorite superhero movies are from the early 2000s. You got the OG Spider-Man, we got X2, which changed my life. This has the worst qualities of all those movies without any of the fun perks. That means there's no butt rock. Not one butt rock song. Which means you just have to listen to his voice the entire movie. So if you somehow find yourself in a room with Dr. Michael Morbius roaring at you, you just might be looking for something to help block it out. Something like today's sponsor, Raycon. That was a flawless segue, I don't know what you mean. So I like to try to pretend to be a functioning human being. You know, cleaning, cooking, running errands, maybe getting in some kind of physical activity. And the only way that I can get myself to do any of these tasks is by having something to listen to while I'm moving around from room to room or out and about. And Raycon makes that possible with quality, comfort, and style. I've been using the everyday earbuds that somehow got even more comfortable with these new optimized gel tips. They feel even better in my ears and keep them super secure in place no matter what I'm doing. With eight hours of playtime, a 32 hour battery life, compact fit, and a variety of colors, Raycon are guaranteed to have the perfect pair for you starting about half the price of other premium wireless buds. So if you want to pretend to be a functioning human being like me and find out why Raycon have so many five-star reviews, head on over to buyraycon.com Jedi or click the link in the description below to save 15%. Morbius tells the story of Michael Morbius, a scientist with a rare blood disorder desperately trying to cure himself before he falls apart. And he wants to do this with vampire bats from Costa Rica. Costa Rica, Costa And that's fine, it's a comic book movie. I'm not gonna nitpick the science. My favorite superheroes were literally just born that way. You will notice, you probably can't read it, but I am appropriately attired with my, this is the skin of a killer Bella shirt. I've worn it before, but like this shirt is it's just too good. And I'm fine with them steering into the idea of the mad scientist, you know, like destroying himself and creating some manner of destruction in the pursuit of his obsessions. It just doesn't work here. The scene itself is way too cheesy and far too abrupt, but that's fine. Uh, we're in the same universe as Venom, so uh, the cheese is to be expected and accepted. And while it is unintentionally hilarious at times, like the original Venom, this movie, is barely a movie. It feels like somebody made a Cliff Notes video out of a mini series and was like, yeah, that'll give people the general idea. There's a lot of really bad or awkward special effects, enough slow-mo moments in the fight scenes to make Zack Snyder blush, and there's literally no resolution in the story. And also the end credit mid-roll scenes are bad. There's not really a character arc. Jared Leto, as always, method acted his way through this one too, and honestly, not impressed anymore. Terrorizing your coworkers to play a character that exists in the same universe as this Venom is fucking lame. Basically, method acting can have its place, but it can also just make you a massive dickhead, and I will let uh, you figure out where I fall on this scale for Leto. Uh, unrelated, uh, did you know that he was so trash, I mean committed to the role, that he would insist on using his crutches to go to the bathroom, but then the break started lasting so long that it was holding up filming, so they had to negotiate with him to start using a wheelchair. Meaning that for this compromise to work, someone had to then push him around in this wheelchair. The man is a fucking menace and there are so many different layers that make that behavior just absolutely horrible. And I wanna give a hug to any of the people who had to work on set and try to wrangle him while getting yelled at by their superiors because Mr. Leto needed to take a number two. There is not a performance in the world that is worthy of this behavior, but the fact that it was for fucking Morbius it's astounding. Also, I don't feel like Morbius comes across as a distinct character in the slightest, so it didn't even work. Unless his commitment is literally like, I learned how to roar real good, guys. Just real good I learned how to roar. <laughs> like, Jared, why didn't you just pretend that every time you had to go to the bathroom, you would just guzzle down some fresh blood? And other than that, there are some inconsistency with this movie from the trailer to the movie. Uh, I think I had actually only seen the teaser trailer that was released two years ago. <laughs> 
And it seems like quite a bit has changed, or at least some things were moved around, but uh, uh, we'll get into that. For me, uh, the most egregious is that they literally cut the only joke from the trailer that I thought was funny. I am Venom. I'm just kidding, it's Dr. Michael Morbius at your service. So they kept the Venom line, which is the part that really didn't make a lot of sense, because I don't think Venom's catchphrase would have worked its way into the general populace and be known in New York all the way from San Francisco, but who knows? Like the cops know about what happened in San Francisco, and I'm sure that was all around the news of like some like weird monster thing, like breaking the city apart. Yes, breaking the city apart, but like, would they know? The catchphrase, I am Venom. Like, would they know that? I don't think so. But I could be wrong. Maybe I'm nitpicking. I'm just saying. But like, then they cut the like, oh, just uh, Dr. Michael Morbius line, which was goofy, but so fun. And I'm not saying that this movie had to be funny at all. If it was going to be, I wanted it to be more unintentionally so because I really didn't personally have any hopes for this movie. They released it on April Fool's, but they delivered the first half of the line, which was still supposed to be a joke and have comedic value. So like, why cut the end of it? I'm so disappointed. And then one line that I don't think was in the trailer uh, that definitely felt like a reference to make people be like, ha ha. MCU. The big thing with this is that it just feels like they're trying to trick the audience into thinking that this is actually part of the MCU that's been Sony's shtick for a while. But uh, when he's trying to get the cops to give him like his synthetic blood, he's like, I'm getting hungry. You won't like me when I'm hungry. Morbius, more like Hulkius. It's late, let's keep moving. There were some other changes made from the trailer to the movie. Uh, the most confounding is the fact that everyone lost their shit over two things in a variety of ways. Wrong people who were genuinely excited and people like me who wanted to put their heads through a wall at Sony's continued ass hattery. There's a scene where Morbius walks by a wall and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man is spray painted on it with the word murderer over top. And then there's this scene with Adrian Toomes, AKA the Vulture. So a bunch of people were like, oh, holy fuck, it's MCU Spidey's character with Raimi. Like, what the fuck, what the fuck's happening? But when people went to the movie, the graffiti Spidey is nowhere to be seen. And the explanation for that is that Sony just put it there for the trailer without running it by the director. It has nothing to do with the story. It's not implemented into the story. Multi-million dollar studio here, ladies and gentlemen. Holy shit. Um, how do we make people give a shit about this and trick them into thinking that it has anything to do with the MCU continuity so people feel like they have to come see it? But let's get into the movie. Spoilers, obviously. So after the Costa Rica intro that I already mentioned, we get like the weirdest pinhole transition that just screamed, the editor has discovered the built-in iMovie transitions and we said, sure, pal. And we're in Greece where a young Michael Morbius is in a hospital receiving blood transfusions for his rare blood disease and new Milo shows up and almost immediately dies until our young Mr. Morbius uses a spring from a pen to fix his transfusion machine. And this scene is weird as hell. The dialogue makes it sound like it's a single scene. Like if you looked away for a second, you wouldn't really know, but they move locations a couple times before new Milo almost dies. And it's because they're trying to make it feel like they've been building up this strong friendship. It's just so abrupt and didn't manage to build any kind of connection between the two characters that would suggest that they've been talking for like a couple months or even a couple weeks. It just feels like something major was cut. I also need to point out how drastically the color grade was changed from the teaser trailer to the final one. I am astounded. Uh, there's actually a lot of color changes between the different trailers. I, I don't understand. I will also point out that when Milo grows up, he turns into Matt Smith. And I had no idea that Matt Smith was in this movie. I clearly forgot from the teaser trailers two years ago. So that was actually unbelievably shocking to me. He is also the highlight of this movie. If Leto was shitty method acting, uh, Matt Smith felt like he showed up with a bottle of Jack Daniels on the daily and just had a blast. He is dancing around, being evil, so fun. But after his MacGyvering, Morbius earns himself a one-way ticket to a school for gifted kids 
in New York. Nope, not that school. So he heads off and he ends up sending Milo a letter that they'll always be friend, which gets pulled out of the window uh, by a gust of wind. So the local kids start making fun of it because it sounds a little bit like a love letter. So Milo bitch smacks one of the kids with his crutch. And then after Jared Harris pulls the kids off of him, uh, Milo just resumes wailing on this kid, still recovering from blunt force trauma. Foreshadowing. And just as suddenly as we get the intro into his childhood, we are back to Dr. Michael Morbius, about to collect his Nobel Prize for creating synthetic human blood. But he doesn't care, it's all about finding a way to cure himself and his patience, I guess. So one of his colleagues, Martine Bancroft, finally realizes what he's doing, so agrees to help him. And of course it works, but also not really at all. I'm pretty sure it momentarily kills him and then turns him into the living vampire. And all this is happening on a boat because it's an unauthorized scientific experiment being funded by Milo. Uh, they've stayed close and he is very wealthy. Morbius then just viciously uh, murders all the hired mercenaries on board, but manages to stop himself from killing the unnecessary romantic insert character of Martine Bancroft. And she's unnecessary for many reasons in that I don't feel like there's ever really much romantic tension built between them. And because there's clearly so much romantic tension between Morbius and Milo. Honestly, for everything Sony does with these Spidey adjacent movies, they all feel very romantic in ways that they don't intend them to. And he just hops off the boat. The murders were decently tense, I suppose. Lots of goofy POV flying murders, people being like drug up from the bottom. People in my screening actually were jump scared. Uh, Cause like, I don't know, I guess no one got the memo that it was supposed to be silly, but I guess good for them for enjoying the ride. But obviously an abandoned boat off the coast of the Atlantic with a bunch of bodies drained of blood, except for one one knocked out doctor when the Mayday call came from a dude raised some suspicions. Also probably all of the science gear. So eventually they are on the hunt for Dr. Michael Morbius who has been locked away in his office trying to figure out the mechanics of his new way of life, very scientifically. He does all sorts of tests like ball tossing, jumping around his office like a monkey, monkey man, man and becoming one with the bats, his brothers. But with the increased health, speed, strength, echolocation, and uggo face, there's a dark side. See, to sustain his health and keep his disease under wraps, he needs human blood. He specifies that it's human, but I certainly did not see him ripping into a deer to test this theory. And his synthetic blood only works temporarily and the window between feedings gets lower and lower. But I'd have to presume that human blood would eventually have the same effect and become less effective over time. But like, who knows? Point is he knows he either needs to fix it or off himself. But honestly, you were already going through like gallons of blood for your disease. I am sure there are plenty of weirdos out there willing to offer themselves up or make some donations. Like clearly drinking from a blood bag doesn't seem to affect you negatively. So like you're a doctor, you've got some time before the rumors start. Except a sweet little nurse ends up brutally murdered in the hospital. And this scene was actually uh, pretty tense. Uh, this is the type of thing if it happened to you, you would uh, absolutely be shitting your pants. Uh, the lights are in that eco mode. So like they shut down in different sections as you clear them. Uh, but then the lights start turning on like way behind her as something's like quicker and quicker getting closer. And then you're like, Michael, what did you do? But it wasn't Michael. It was Milo. See, he uh, stole the serum and somehow dosed himself with it and killed this poor woman, but we will get there. And if you're wondering how he knows, uh, he went to the lab to check on Morbius and finds him locked in his glass little room to test how long he can go without blood. And he lets Milo know that he needs blood by writing blood on the glass in his blood. It's very artistic, you wouldn't understand. But at least Milo didn't kill as many people as Morbius did that first night, at least as far as I'm aware. It's like, who's the real monster here? Just cause he killed a bunch of murder for hires? Either way, the most annoying cops in the world uh, tracked down Morbius, who is obviously being blamed for this recent murder. And he was already a prime suspect for what happened on the boat. And even with his literal superpowers, the cops catch him on the roof almost immediately. He doesn't even try to fight them or get away. <laughs> but it's all good. His friendly, not lawyer, lawyer Milo shows up with a little blood gift bag. I think I originally wrote little blood bag gift. 
little blood gift bag. <laughs> but when he leaves, he ends up leaving his cane behind, meaning that he's not having trouble walking anymore. So Morbius realizes that he's the one who murdered the nurse. So he breaks out of prison to try and stop him. And to him, it's like, man, don't worry. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to help us. But like Milo believes that they are the next stage in evolution, that it's them against the many, like the Spartans. And all they really need to do is control themselves and save it for the people who deserve it, like paper salesmen and dudes in bars who are slightly rude to him, the real villains of New York City. So Morbius is obviously not down and they start chasing each other uh, with these wisps of color that fly off them, which I don't fully get. Um, I thought it was supposed to be like a smoke trail or something, but it changes color depending on what color their clothing is. Uh, so it makes it more like a visual artifact. Like it does kind of look cool. So I don't know if it's supposed to be some kind of like weird visualization of echolocation uh, because they can actually see with their eyes. So it's not like in Daredevil. I don't know, it was probably just a style choice to cover up how stupid it would look as they're like flying around. Oh, sorry, it wasn't flying yet until they get down into the subway system and Milo just like murks a bunch of cops and then Morbius to get away with him starts feeling the air coming off the train or the subway train and then glider suits through the subway tunnels. <laughs> Cinema. That is actually really funny. It goes from like so cool with the wisps coming off of his hand and then he's just kind of like, I'm a squirrel. I'm sorry. And from here, it's really just a mess. I know it already sounded like a mess, but... So the unnecessary romantic interest is being followed by the police, but Morbius ends up finding her first. Uh, they didn't steal some like counterfeit money operations hidden grunge lab to do their science. But before he finds the lab, they are casually having coffee at a diner in broad daylight when every newspaper is looking for the vampire killer Morbius because they now know there is a second killer and they think the disease is spreading. Like I get that New York is a big place, but like, why are you just casually sitting in a diner? You're not even like, you know, no hood up, no sunglasses, no nothing. And I think from here, the police are mostly just like out of the story. Like I said, they know that there is another killer because they saw the footage of uh, Milo killing some dudes from a club. Never stop Milo from hitting on a girl because you will die. But the final plan, because Morbius can't come up with a cure in time to stop Milo from working his way through every mild annoyance in Manhattan, is to make a serum to kill him and then makes a second dose for himself. Again, I feel confident that he could deal with this for a while before it became a serious issue, but oh well. Oh, and he and Martine kiss. Uh, it's really weird. <laughs> there were light implications from Milo that Michael was into her in a way that kind of implied that he, as in like Milo, would be into her too. Uh, but then they are suddenly on a rooftop and he's just like, close your eyes and kisses her. Except it feels really weird because the way he said, close your eyes, it was more like, oh, I'm gonna show you something cool. Except then it was just his lips, which is not cool at all. And then we see that Milo's spying on them and he is pissed. Oh, also, uh, Jared Harris has still been around this whole time as Milo's private doctor, and Milo kills him in anger because he doesn't want to be stopped. And in some really unfortunate luck, as he's dying, he calls Morbius to come over so that he can tell him about Milo. But he already knows, dude, and that just gave Milo the opening uh, to go grab Martine, which is when things get even dumber. So Morbius hunts them down, and she's been abandoned on a rooftop dance floor, bleeding from her neck. And the one thing that annoys me about these people needing blood to survive is that they don't actually seem to have a bloodlust other than that like first night. Uh, there's no struggle that makes it so that you can't stop yourself from doing it, which I guess is fine, but whatever. Uh, so she is still alive. Uh, instead of like rushing her to a hospital, doing anything to stop the bleed, she's just like, make it mean something. As in, drain me of blood so that you have enough energy to kill him. And instead he ends up feeding her some of his blood. Uh, and then I guess it doesn't work fast enough. So he just does drink her blood. It's a very messy scene and then he just like leaves her there. But again, he's a doctor. He specializes in blood. He has superpowers. I really think more could have been done here, but I get it, plot progression. So he's off to chase Milo. They start fighting and Morbius calls in a bat army with a bat scream. 
It's incredible stuff. And then he like hand controls the bats into Milo. Because as has been established, he has this like ultra special connection with them. Even though Milo used the exact same serum, but I guess Morbius is the chosen bat whisperer. Like, I don't know if these were supposed to be like his actual bats that like somehow broke out of their cage at his lab. I. It's just so funny that it's not like a vocal command that would make sense. It is literally just somehow something coming out of his hand like a sorcerer just pushing them at Milo. So this fight is over pretty fast, uh, which I'm fine with because I just didn't think it was going to stay that interesting. The bats overwhelm him enough for Morbius to stick him with the kill serum. They have that final, it was supposed to be us against the world, the few against the many, like Spartans. I'm sorry, my, that is not a British accent. I'm so sorry. Then in a swarm of bats, Morbius flies out of the gutters totally avoiding police detection as they look on in horror. And you're thinking, okay, he's gonna go check on Martine. Something's gonna happen so that he doesn't have to serum himself. But no, uh, we see uh, Martine's eyes snap open, uh, looking, looking all vampiric, uh, implying that she is now the first turned vampire Oh no, what's gonna happen when Morbius finds out? Well, I have no fucking idea because the movie just ends with them shooting up out of the hole into the camera and then it's done. Are you fucking kidding me? It's like they had exactly an hour and 45 minutes to work with, not a second longer, and they just had no idea how to set this movie up to accommodate to that correctly. And I feel like this is confirmed because I went back and watched all the trailers and the teaser trailers after watching the movie and we clearly see Morbius in some kind of swap bus and vultures there like you and I should keep in touch which is now part of the second mid-roll scene uh, in a completely different location and I feel like it had to be a reshoot which we'll get to in a second so it felt like the movie was too long for Sony so they chopped the end off and the mid-roll scenes in general are not great so you see the sky rift like in no way home but shitty and suddenly Adrian Toomes, AKA the Vulture, is somehow zapped into the Venom universe in prison, which doesn't make sense, but sure, fine. And he doesn't exist in this universe already, so they have to let him out of prison. And that's the scene, we just get like a news report audio where it's like that there's a trial underway uh, to, to have him released because he didn't commit any crimes here. So even though he was a criminal in another timeline, uh, they can't keep him locked up. We'll get to the next one in a second, but I really don't like this for a couple of reasons, but I guess it was potentially bound to happen anyway. So I really love Spider-Man Homecoming. And one of my favorite things about that movie is like the vulture having that growth to not blame Peter for him being in jail and by proxy not blaming Spider-Man for what happened to put him in jail either. Realizing that Peter Parker as Spider-Man or Spider-Man as Peter Parker is the only reason he's alive. It's like the only reason that he's gonna be able to see his daughter grow up. But after the end of No Way Home, there's a couple different ways to interpret how this would have gone down. The one that I would have liked to have seen is him forgetting that Peter Parker is Spider-Man like everyone else, but logically he should still remember that Spider-Man saved his life. But in this, it seems to imply uh, that he's still a bad guy, like everything from the way he talks and behaves, it doesn't feel like, oh shit, I've now literally been ripped out of the timeline where my daughter, where my wife, the people that I did the crime for in the first place to provide for the people that I love, I'm gone. He's not torn up over that. He's like, oh, okay. It's just so dumb. And apparently more Sony meddling, according to the director, that was like, that's kind of really all on them. And I get why they want that, but like, why ruin a good character? So then cuts to the next scene, which is a reshoot, which just basically uses the line from the trailer and a couple of other things. Uh, so it's Morbius driving out to a field, Vulture shows up, but like as the Vulture in his suit and he never takes off his mask. So I feel like they absolutely did not have access to Michael Keaton. And he just delivers the like, yeah, we should like keep in touch or team up or something. And then Morbius is all like, what did you have in mind? And in this team up request specifically says that he doesn't know how he got here, uh, but that it has something to do with Spider-Man. He thinks it has something to do with Spider-Man. So in my opinion, that seems to be suggesting like negative thoughts towards a Spider-Man. And that is very annoying to me with this character specifically. And it's either bad guy stuff or good guy stuff or like vigilante, anti-hero stuff. I don't care, it's stupid. This movie is stupid. Yes, I know there are like multiple different types of team up things that could be going on here. And I don't, I don't care. You can look them up if you want to. I just don't feel like going through all of them because it's not, 
is not what interests me. And that's Morbius. It's making a fair amount of money. Um, I used a free ticket, so I don't know if I contributed to this. I'm sorry if so. Uh, I am so very done with Sony and the choices they make. With these movies specifically, at least the first Venom hit a level of stupid that became hilarious, but then it birthed the rest of this and their insistence on trying to just connect the two together. It annoys me less now because I won't go into it anymore. People are already mad at me enough. I will just leave it as it doesn't upset me as much as it used to thinking about MCU Spider-Man being connected into this stuff. But yeah, let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. I'm sure there is a bunch of other little tidbits that I skipped over that I'm not thinking of, but I am not going to see this again to jostle my memory. Uh, so let me know if you agree, if you disagree, if you somehow found this charming. There are, it's not all shit. It just barely felt like a movie to me. But if you enjoyed it, please let me know why down below. Um, I kind of wanted this to just be dumber. That's my, that was my hope for the best case scenario, but thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay. We'll catch you all later.